Thank you for joining me today. Um, it's really great being back at Cal State Long Beach um, for a number of reasons, but mostly because um, I was one of you at one point, and I got into Cal State Long Beach, I got into Senior Studio, I got my BS in Industrial Design, made it into the workforce, and I, uh, actually, wait a second, let me start over. Um, <clears throat> Hi, I'm Amber Lundy. <laughs> I, uh, I was one of you, and it was, it was interesting. Um, so eventually I made it to Cal State Long Beach and, and got into the industrial design program, but um, it was kind of a long, long complicated story. I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but let's start from the beginning. Um, my, my dad uh, was an executive at Mattel Toys. So I was pretty lucky. I grew up with a lot of prototypes and short runs and concepts sitting around the house and tooling and computers and electronics that I got to play with growing up. Um, and I thought everybody grew up like that. So a lot of people do grow up like that these days, but maybe not all the tooling stuff. Um, so I didn't know what I wanted to do for school. I uh, really just loved art. I was pushed into art quite a bit as a kid. And then um, at some point I got heavy into computers because uh, we actually got evacuated from Indonesia. The country was imploding. There was a lot of economic destabilization. Um, and we had to move back to the United States. And I did not understand kids my own age in the United States at all. I didn't, I thought they were pretty bratty. And there was a lot of stuff going on. I just didn't get kids out here. And all my friends had to leave Indonesia at the same time. And they all had to go back to their countries as well. So. Everybody just went and moved to all these different countries around the world. And you can imagine it might be pretty hard to stay in touch with all those people and pretty expensive. So I got really obsessed with staying connected with them online. Um, I didn't have many friends in real life in the United States, so I got really heavily into computers, uh, computer security, computer hacking, telephony, uh, telephone freaking. I spent a lot of my spare time building freaking equipment in my bedroom. My Sweet 16 party was a root fest for the local 2600 club. And I owned and I won. But um, then I got into some big legal trouble, which we won't go into too much because this is being recorded and I am fully employed right now. Um, <laughs> but after I got into legal trouble, I was basically given some options. Uh, I, well, they, I can't tell if they were quite options or kind of requirements, but I was told I should try and pursue college and do something good with my curiosity. Um, so both my judge and my parents told me, you know, go pursue college. So I doubled down on that. I still didn't know what I wanted to do. I bummed around community college quite a bit. Um, architecture, fashion, interior design, uh, cooking school at some point, um, law school at one point as well. And then eventually I had a conversation with my dad one night and he reminded me about this uh, Barbie designer that I had seen at Mattel when I was young. There was a take your daughter to work day and my dad was gracious enough to bring his little gothy daughter to work with him in uh, El Segundo. It was decked to the nines and all black and had my spikes on and everything. And uh, I talked to this Barbie designer who showed me his concept all the way through to the production run. The concept was this beautiful, um, beautiful Barbie, there was like real diamonds, it was porcelain, it was gorgeous. And then there was the business iteration, and then there was a tooling iteration, and then there was a product viability iteration based on market feedback. And slowly it got all the way down to the production model, and he was like, and this is what is on shelves today. And I kind of stored that in the back of my head as a kid and didn't think about it too much, but my dad brought it back up again, I went searching online, he said, yeah, that guy was an industrial designer. So when I went searching online, Cal State Long Beach was one of the only schools that came up with an industrial design program that was within California. I really didn't want to leave California because it was nice weather, nice and beachy. So I applied. Um, I magically got in, even though I didn't take the SATs. Uh, and then once I got into Cal State Long Beach, that's probably where the curve starts to, right up, right up at the top there. So I got in. Um, and then I got super distracted by everything that happens in college. I thought I would minor in poli-sci at one point. Um, I joined the debate team. I ended up double majoring in communication studies because I failed my first portfolio review and did not get into senior studio. And I do not hold it against you <laughs> at all. 
I think it was well worth it. Um, so I went back and I, I actually worked on my portfolio, reflected a lot on what I cared about. But I had kind of a pivotal meeting with Dave Tubner at one point. I was telling him I was done with industrial design. I'm just going to go off and build windmills in North Dakota at the time. Give up and go design windmills in North Dakota. Um, but he convinced me to stick around and try it again. And I'm really glad that I did because the education that I got in Senior Studio is what made me um, the powerful design tool that I am today. <laughs> the, the ability to execute and the people that I worked with in that class were so inspiring that I look back on it now and I wish I had thought about it more. Just the, the environment that you're in, the opportunity that you have to learn from different people in that kind of a situation is pretty unique. So I'm really glad I made it into Senior Studio. Um, then I graduated. While I was in Senior Studio, I was working the whole time at a couple different startups. I worked at AN Design Lab. Anybody from AN in here today? Andrew Numinga Design Lab? I worked at AN Design Lab for a while as a prototype shop intern. And then I got a job in San Diego while I was still in Senior Studio at a computer security company because the hacking, freaking background um, got my foot in the door. And then I was able to draw enough analogies from my industrial design portfolio to user experience design that they were willing to give me a shot at an internship. Fast forward to, I think, two years later, I was the only UX designer in the um, security lab working on collective threat intelligence projects that were helping the federal government and the NSA and the FBI. There's plenty of big three-letter organiza three organizations that were consumers of these things that I was working on. And I got my first uh, taste of machine learning, UX design, and some really interesting, amazing people. But then a venture capital firm bought WebSense, and they became Raytheon WebSense, and then they became Forcepoint. Recently, they rebranded. So definitely sounds you know, like a forceful, secure tool. Yeah, they rebranded to Forcepoint. Um, you probably don't know any of their products, but you've definitely been touched by them if you're using the internet. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, there's a lot of monitoring and security analysis and threat detection. Um, then after that, um, I did a two-week stint at Intuit and decided it really wasn't for me. And I quit in the middle of a meeting, which was pretty exciting. And <laughs> I didn't have another job lined up. But one of the engineers I worked with at Raytheon WebSense called me and he had just gotten to a little startup called Emotient, and they really needed a UX designer. And I didn't know it at the time, but Emotient would be one of my biggest jobs, one of the most intense jobs that I would ever have. Um, I also didn't know at the time that they were going to get bought by Apple a couple weeks after I left and joined Amazon. So if you're familiar with like the face ID, face unlock, face stuff that the new iPhone is doing. That was um, in part what, of what Emotion was working on. But Emotion had um, a machine learning classifier that they had productized and put in the cloud that would do sentiment analysis in real time through video feed data. So you look at a machine, you look at a camera, the machine learning classifier could identify what you're feeling, they can identify your engagement, they can identify certain health issues that might be going on with you. And portray that in real time or actuate different programmed mechanisms in real time. So if you start feeling sad, turn on the good music, right? Those kinds of scenarios. They had a lot of different market verticals they were going after, and I spent my time concepting for each of these different verticals. So medical industry, um, legal industry, the lawyer wants to tell when somebody's lying on the stand. Uh, there's plenty that I can't really talk about yet, but. Yeah, they got bought by Apple, and they're doing some cool stuff over there. So after that, um, I got picked up by a little company called Amazon, and I'm doing some pretty sweet stuff over there that I cannot go into at all. I'm sorry. Maybe off camp? No, I'm joking. Um, and the whole time I've been working at Amazon, um, I kind of lucked out, and I had to relocate and move to Seattle which I didn't anticipate all the crazy creative people that live up there, but I just so happened to move next to a guy that does fashion show production up in Seattle. And my senior project in industrial design studio was that wearable down there on the end, which 
at the time was pretty primitive, but since then I've been doing a bunch of work with different performing artists, doing a lot of fashion wearables for their performances. Um, I've gone through a couple different iterations of wearable uh, fingernails, light up fingernails myself. Um, this one the most successful. And leaning into the cyborg stuff, I also have um, an NFC transponder implant in my hand which I was not successful in getting my work badge on because it turns out Amazon likes to secure their badges and it's pretty hard to clone those things. So it doesn't have my badge on it yet, but someday. <clears throat> so I'm still kind of doing this all over the place, but um, all of it has led me to what I've come here to talk to you about today, which is body hacking and trends in cyborg products. This is the stuff that I like to nerd out on when I have you know, time. Um, and it's just kind of this theme that runs throughout everything that I've done. So to get this topic started, I would like to take us all on a quick journey through human history and begin here. Way, way back in the day, <laughs> when human beings came from environments like this, um, our bodies were adapting to it. Uh, somebody realized that we could start taking materials from this environment and make tools. Um, then they realized they could take other materials from this environment and combine those with these tools, um, make even cooler tools that would enable them to do even cooler things. Then you combine those materials with water and you start to get other things like steam, heat, um, get steam powered mechanisms and you start to get cottage industry. Big boom in cottage industry. And then once you start compressing that energy down even further and further and you start getting these big steam powered mechanisms, you start getting alchemy and different types of materials like metals and eventually plastics. And then we start getting analog electronic machinery for mass manufacturing. And mass manufacturing started producing tons of information. We needed to communicate really quickly. And we had a ton of power that we needed to transfer all over the place. So we built this giant power grid all over the place, this giant grid that started connecting everything. And then we ended up with a, the start of the big data problem, even worse today. But we had to figure out what to do with all that data. So we started building these giant network knocks and computer systems, building out the internet. And now we have the information age, the post-digital age. We took our environment from this kind of situation to something a little bit more like this in a lot of places. And you can imagine, you know, this is pretty different, right? The human body doesn't adapt and make the same tools like it used to doesn't need the same things it needed at some point, maybe. You're physiologically reacting differently to your environment. So what's a pudgy little human supposed to do in this new environment? It's kind of intimidating. This is where the idea of cyborg survivalism and body hacking comes in. I'm not going to be talking about trendy calorie counters or the artificial intelligence that's coming to kill you in your sleep. Um, I'm just going to be talking about what humans have always done, and that is taking material from their environment, producing tools that their body then uses in order to enable them to complete some sort of action, soothe their senses, and possibly extend their identity or self-expression a little bit. So soothing your senses, everybody might be kind of familiar with that. I'm talking about your sense of taste, touch, sight, sound, and smell. Hopefully we're all pretty familiar. There's varying degrees of all of these with everybody. But if you think of those general senses, step back just for a minute. Close your eyes and imagine just a little bit. You don't have to close your eyes, but you can try. Imagine your walk or your commute into campus today. Maybe you saw somebody sending a text message or making a phone call. Uh, maybe somebody was playing with their hair, somebody was listening to music, someone took a left turn to go where they're going. Each and every one of those experiences, normal everyday experiences, can be enhanced and optimized and tweaked in different ways. And body hacking and cyborg products and services allow us to do this. So 
For example, maybe your commute or your walk to, to and from class or into campus might have felt a little bit less like a rat race if you could feel the people walking in front of you or behind you with haptic feedback earrings like Moon Rebus has on right here. She can feel those people moving around her in a way. Even if she didn't have sight, she'd be able to feel this. Um, now, she's done a little bit more than just enhance her ability to feel the people around her. Moon Rebus is a pretty fascinating woman that I'd like to focus on for just a moment because she's um, a performing artist at heart. She's been a dancer for most of her life, and she's obsessed with movement. So much so that these days she actually has a haptic feedback sensor built into her elbow that is attached to the seismic sensors across our planet. So anytime there's an earthquake anywhere on the planet, she feels it in her body. Um, sometimes big earthquakes wake her up in the middle of the night. But she walks around this planet imagining her day as being part of the Earth's movement which is a whole nother level of being obsessed with movement as a dancer. I think it's pretty interesting. If that's not your thing, you could maybe imagine some other scenarios, but you could also just save us some time imagining your whole commute into work if you would just stream it via your eyeball like iBorg. Um, iBorg had a motorcycle accident at one point and he had the opportunity to replace his eyeball with a video camera can stream that experience right there, record it, analyze. Um, people tell me this image is scary of him, so I will, uh, I don't, it's debatable whether or not an iBorg in a bar is any less scary than, you know, a close-up iBorg, we'll see. He looks pretty cool, though. Nice guy, I'm sure. Um, but maybe you're not that social, you don't wanna stream your entire live experience with everybody and you're more secluded, more of a worker, want to get some stuff done on your way in, um, you could send some of those emails or some of those text messages while you're playing with your hair and walking around. These are hairables. They're a conductive, programmable matrix that you can weave onto your head. So when you twirl your hair in certain directions, you can send that text message. You can te Anything that you can programmatically do through an interface, you can control with your hair. I really want some of these at some point. <laughs> um, and you could, you know, send some angry messages every time you're thinking about some X or something, or every single album. <laughs> or maybe you just want to chill, lay back a little bit, listen to some music while you're walking around. Go ahead and implant that magnet in your ear, wear a metal coil around your neck that has some magnetism in it and effectively turn your ear into a speaker. Same diaphragm effect. Now here's an opportunity right here for an improvement in V2, right? The sound quality here isn't that great yet. The concept is interesting. But this guy has a speaker built into his ear. Maybe you didn't even make it to campus, but that's probably unlikely since you're here. But maybe you have a problem with direction, um, getting to and from places. So. This thing is pretty cool. This is the North Sense. Um, it gives you a little bit of haptic feedback every time you're facing true north anywhere on the planet. And it's attached with these two subdermal um, bars. Anybody that's used to body modification, body piercings, just bar piercings, right? And then this thing attaches and detaches. You can unplug it while you're sleeping or while you're taking a shower if you want to, but it is waterproof. And then you can you know, charge it back up, put it back on. It's opt-in you know, wearable. But it does give you a sense improvement, right? You can sense where north is. <clears throat> so some of these things may seem a little superfluous at this point, not so practical. Um, like maybe the ability to smell what time of day it is. That's a little different. Um, although the artist di here did get contacted by Swatch, who was seriously interested in giving people the ability to smell what time of day it is. So <coughs> concepts you know, can really inspire quite a lot. Or the same artist actually made um, this pretty sweet MP3 player that lets you listen to music through your teeth <laughs> and control music with your grill. Um, pretty sweet, pretty fun, maybe superfluous, I don't know, it's a pretty cool one. 
Um, then there's the more practical stuff, like the NFC transponder that I've got that allows you to get in and out of places, transfer information with people, make purchases, um, conduct business in general. And then some things are starting to get a little bit more dangerous but fun. Um, like these little guys from Grindhouse Wetware. These are subdermable light up uh, implants that turn on and off with a magnet in your finger. Um, there's some people that have quite a lot of these and their, their bodies are starting to look very alien in some situations. And I think this is a really interesting opportunity because there's, um, yeah, there's some dangerous aspects for sure. Uh, the implantation installation process can get kind of tricky with these. Um, you might not want to do it yourself. You probably want to work with medical professionals. Um, but I think what, uh, what Grindhouse Wetware is doing here is pretty interesting. They've got a lot of electronics built in there, some great power pack mechanisms. They also have this thing called the Circadia, which um, can be implanted in your arm. And it allows you to completely monitor your body's um, homeostasis, everything that's happening within your body, your salinity, blood pressure, like quite a lot of things. But you'll see pretty quickly, it's got some opportunity for improvement in the form factor in particular, because it literally looks like a box shoved under your arm. Um, I hope this one inspires some of those industrial designers out here to really think a little bit <laughs> about form factor and the body. Because there's, there's beauty and then there's beauty. This is beautiful on a lot of levels, but won't go too far. Then there's some even more dangerous, pot, I mean, you know, it's debatable. This idea of nootropics is definitely body hacking, dangerous zone. All these different types of um, synthetic, uh, organic drugs that people can take, um, digital drugs now, that you can take. You know, you want to stop feeling stress, just completely stop your brain from producing the thing that produces stress, you know, get one step ahead of it. Um, I'm not going to go too far into this because this has a whole rabbit hole that you can go down. One of the other ones that I think is kind of fascinating but also dangerous is this whole DIY community that has sprung up around um, transcranial magnetic brain stimulation, which is this fascinating group of people um, that hold a lot of like impressive degrees. And they've created a DIY community around stimulating your brain with um, electronic force in order to change how you perform, how you feel, what your brain does throughout the day. Um, so there's people out there sharing gestalts of the brain or kind of topological maps of the brain where you can stimulate, how much to stimulate in certain places. They might wake up and stimulate their brain in the morning so that they can feel like no stress at all for, you know. There's a lot that can happen in this space, which is interesting, but I, I would say maybe kind of a little dangerous to do it yourself at home. Maybe. But still, I kind of want to make one of these things. <clears throat> so we might be getting a little bit down the rabbit hole. We're not just talking about enhancing your commute anymore. We're talking about how we're all kind of naturally cyborgs. Um, I hope we can all admit this now after my awesome intro that explained this to you. Now. Um, so one thing to except before we move further down the rabbit hole, is that we are naturally cyborgs. We are hardware and software made up of our environment. We decay, we can be upgraded, we can be reprogrammed, just like any other piece of software material product in our environment. And in our natural state, we consume our environment, um, create these technologies that we attach to our body in order to enable us to survive and thrive. I covered this earlier, but I think we can all kind of maybe accept a little bit of that now and move a little bit farther down the rabbit hole. I think we should take the blue one. Or was it the red one? The red one? Okay. The red one. We're going to take the red one. I hope you're not too excited. Take the red one. Chill out. We're going to go a little bit farther down the rabbit hole. No big deal. Let's talk about how we can invert our relationship a little bit with technologies um, just a little bit more. So in terms of interaction experiences, interacting with products, this right here is the quantum interface. 
And the control unit that this woman's holding in her hand is supposedly going to be uh, handheld at some point in the, this year, supposedly. Um, and the AR, actually the virtual reality headset that she's wearing is going to be AR. There's a lot of variations here, but what I want to point out is that she's freeform creating interfaces in space. You can see what she's writing over here. But what this software allows you to do is freeform create an interface in space. And then you can create a point within that freeform arc that is programmatically uh, an actuator for anything that you want to attach to this piece of software. So imagine this use case, one of the coolest ones that I've heard for this thing, a physician actually using this unit to stand inside the cancerous tumor of their patient, examine, control, and operate on the tumor from within the tumor itself, as opposed to being outside of this person's body and operating on a flat interface, trying to understand what's happening inside their body. So allowing you to shrink down a little bit, go inside of a tumor in order to operate on it and see it for yourself in a whole new way. I think that one's um, pretty cool for the interaction space in particular, but also uh, the demands for rendering and or, you know, if it's getting a little too far out there, we can return back to something that's a little familiar, right? That North Sense that we talked about earlier. Um, the CEO of North Sense, though, really changed things for himself and kind of showed me something that's a little deeper down the rabbit hole, which is this ability to reprogram your mental model. So one thing to remember with Senses and with all these products is that there's an installation phase that your body has to go through, that your mind has to go through before you meld with these things, right? There's a learning period, there's an unboxing period, if you will, where maybe you don't read the instructions, but you just kind of absorb the thing. Um, so what he did during his installation phase was he made sure that he was seeing his son or seeing a picture of his son every single time he felt north during those first few weeks when he was first getting set up. So now, anytime he's walking around anywhere on the planet, and he faces north and he gets that haptic feedback. He gets this loving feeling washing over his body because his brain is wrapped around this concept of his son and associating that with the direction of north anywhere that he is on the planet. So he reprogrammed his mental model to feel this loving force every time he faces north on the planet just because he wore this little haptic feedback sensor and got a north sense. Or one of my favorites. Another super cool one is the brain port, which looks like something out of like really early 1990s RoboCop or something, but it's getting better. <laughs> um, and what this does is it actually relies on reprogramming your brain. The idea is that the visual cortex of the brain is a central processing unit that processes all the modalities that your body experiences, all the senses, right? And you can kind of reroute those things if you want to. So you can end up tasting sight. <coughs> this relies heavily on the idea of synesthesia or mixing the different senses and feeling the different senses. There's those people that can like smell sound, taste color. Uh, this one, you're tasting sight. Not necessarily color, but because it is so awesome, I have to cut away from this and show you a video. So let's take, it's really inspirational, I swear. Your brain is what really sees, not your eyes. If your eyes don't work, and you create another portal into the brain then your brain is what is going to interpret the world around you. Brainport is essentially a camera that translates a video image to a plate that I wear in my back. Dead. Hundreds of pixels on the plate tingle on my tongue, and together they form patterns and shapes that my brain interprets as the space around me. The information is the same whether you collect it from your eyes or from our cameras with a tongue display. He knows a lot about his environment already through the sense of sound and touch, and this adds one more piece to the puzzle.
I'm just at the beginning of the stage, but I think you can take this innovation so much farther than probably anyone knows. Now, zoom into what you just did and find your vote. Told you it'd be pretty sweet. <laughs> so my question to you is, did any of you pick up on the cost benefit that happened with that ability that he just gained? Um, he was now able to see with his tongue, but he couldn't talk at the same time anymore, right? Um, so there's a possibility for V2, maybe. Allow me to talk and see with my tongue at the same time. Um, so this leads to the larger question of how do we design for these kinds of products and services and situations? How do we design for the cyborg, the enabled body that's integrating more technologies? I would ask to start, what is accessibility and what does accessibility mean to you? Accessibility is the quality of being easily understood or appreciated. I'm gonna leave it an easy to understand definition and move forward, but Think about it this way. If we're talking about integrating technology into our bodies and being accessible, we're really talking about being accessible to machines, aren't we? Ourselves? So how do machines understand us? Well, it's really not that different from how we understand each other. It's the senses, right? Our human modes or our, our modalities. There's artificial intelligence now that can see that can smell, that can touch, that can hear, all of the senses. Intuition, one of those senses that we'll get to later. <clears throat> so it's not that much different from how humans inter interpret each other and understand and access each other. So we're talking about the full range of senses um, and interpreting them on a measurable scale, a logic map or mathematical spectrum, right? This is how machines understand and look at our modalities. So, what we need to remember is to start with the human, which may sound a little counterintuitive, but let's start with the human, start with people, and remember your human-centered design. So, if we talk about our basic senses and add in this extra sense called intuition, which is really an intelligence, um, or this idea that you know something or you consider something very likely, it's more than an instinct, it's a feeling, but you're, it's pretty likely that you're right. That's intuition. And we're now enabling um, services, products, and machines to have intuition because they have pre-programmed intelligence. They can make assumptions on training sets, um, and they're more likely right than wrong when they're done properly. They can be done wrong in a lot of situations. There's plenty of examples out there. I won't bash on Google too much for being racist with some of their image recognition, but that's totally fine. Just need to have the right kind of training set for your machine learning model. And then consider how each and every one of these senses can be plotted on a spectrum. There's a spectrum of each and every one of these, right? There's a spectrum of uh, the ability to, to hear. There's a spectrum of the ability to taste. 
each and every one of these. You can also cross-reference these. There's a slight shift if you're talking between the different senses. You can have more of a sense of sight, less of a sense of smell. But let's just focus on one for now. Say we're talking about sight. So you can plot this in a number of ways. I'm going to give you one example. There's a ton of options here, and there's plenty of expert theories that go in a lot of different directions. But let's just go with one example for other purposes of demonstration. And let's plot range and clarity with sight. Um, this is starting to look kind of in the, the math realm, right? Um, math was not my specialty, but somehow I still am in technology. It's OK. <clears throat> So we've plotted range and clarity with sight. Now you can do this with each and every single modality um, that a customer has, that an ideal user has, that um, the person you're designing a product for has. And hopefully, at some point, you also created a user journey for that ideal customer. Um, it may be as simple as, as a, I want, so that. As a customer of some sort, I want something or something to happen or something to come to me so that I can accomplish something, and it's awesome. It helps me out. What you want to do here is map the baseline for your ideal scenario for your product design, right? You've got your storyboard. You've got your ideal scenario. Map the baseline for that experience across all these modalities. What does it rely on for the person to execute this ideal journey? and you can kind of map out that sensory experience for these people. Now what you want to do is start messing around with those modalities and mix it up a little bit, create a couple different ones, and then cross-reference them. And when you cross-reference all of these, get a little bit mathematical again, <clears throat> you can start talking about things like complexity and satisfaction, the overall experience. How complex? Was this whole experience for this person? How satisfied are they with the outcome? And when you start looking at all of these different scenarios, these different mixing board scenarios of this product that you're thinking about, you can identify um, the unfavorable situations and ask yourself, what crappy part of this experience can I completely skip over with technology? If I just give a little bit of technological help here, how can we avoid this bad situation? And keep in mind that machines are enabled to see, hear, touch, smell, taste, and intuit as well. So you can really extract the worst parts of these situations and give that work to a machine instead. And this is an opportunity for your design. It's kind of borgify the situation. So basically, human beings can opt out of work. I did say Borgify. Yes. Um, so one thing I want to mention is that life cycles still apply with each and every one of these experiences and products. There's an onboarding, onboarding situation. There's the box opening. There's the learning. Um, your brain has to train up for these things. It takes weeks sometimes to train up into new senses. And senses also don't um, turn on or off. You can't take them on or off necessarily. Your brain, your mental model has now learned this sense. It's always there. There's a reuse and management and optimization phase for each and every one of these. Sometimes you can dull a sense over time if you haven't retrained it enough. Um, you can optimize that sense by overtraining or training for specific scenarios. Then there's upgrades, um, feature building and user hacks. Upgrades in particular is interesting. I'm already looking to take out my um, chip implant because the NFC transponder doesn't work too well and there's a better one available now. Um, so I'll come out pretty quickly. Um, the installation removal process makes it a little bit more difficult to just switch things out. It's not like just going to buy a new one necessarily. And then there's attrition as well. People will stop using these things, so they'll want to quit or they, you know, they'll want to get out, just like any other product or service or software. So. I hope this hasn't been too far down the rabbit hole for you. <laughs> and you've gotten just a little bit of a glimpse of how you can try and integrate technologies into your products and services and into yourselves in any way. Um, I'm fascinated by this space. I find it really inspiring. And this is the future of design that I'm really excited about. 
and I hope all of you uh, take the opportunity to go ideate and concept on some things. And if you do anything, please do share. Broaden the experience for everybody. You'll get good feedback, and it'll make your idea better. Um, and sharing with the, the community is only going to make the concept uh, have a longer lifespan itself. So that's probably all I got. Thank you.